Who's this guy? He's a TV, TV reporter. I have no idea. Do you know who this is? Is it Tim Geithner? Bill Gates? Not quite. It's one of the candidates for president, Gary Johnson. He used to be governor of New Mexico, and then he said things politicians don't often say. Man is superior to government and should remain master over it, not the other way around. Sounds good to me, but the political class didn't like Johnson. Why? I have vetoed the budget. Probably because Governor Johnson vetoed their spending. And now... I am running for president of the United States. Uh, Johnson wants Republicans to pick him to run against President Obama. But how can that happen when most people don't know who he is? Who's this guy? Oh, you got me on that one. I don't know. I don't know. It looks like Woody Harrelson, but no, it's not him. If people don't know Johnson, how can he win the nomination? But if he did, what would he say in a debate against President Obama? Or, well, this guy? Well, let me be clear. Now the government has to leave. No, says Gary Johnson, free people ought to leave. What would a Johnson presidency be like? That's our show tonight. And now, John Stossel. Watching coverage of presidential campaigns, I get frustrated. I don't really get to know the candidate or what he really stands for. Most shows, even the debates, spend only a few minutes or seconds on each candidate. But not on this program. I'm going to devote the full hour of my show to any presidential candidate who I can stomach. And maybe some who I can't. But here's what I kind of like, because he's a libertarian. Gary Johnson, you're a libertarian, right? You know, John, I'm a Republican, but uh, I've been uh, described as a libertarian, and I've always viewed that as a compliment, always. But you run as a Republican. I run as a Republican, uh, the notion of actually getting elected. So uh, in New Mexico, uh, I looked at the Libertarian Party for about uh, a minute and a half one afternoon. I went to a meeting, and I determined that, you know what, I wasn't going to get elected as a Libertarian and uh, chose to uh, do it as a Republican. And you got elected two terms as governor. Uh, you vetoed 750 bills, shed a thousand. <laughs> like that. Shed a thousand state job positions, privatized prisons. This was something other politicians weren't doing at the time, and barely do now. Well, so the promise was was to uh, put the issues that should be on the front burner on the front burner. The promise was was to uh, actually address the issues. Uh, no sacred cows, A through Z. And uh, I, I want to say I was wildly successful. I want to say I really made a difference. Because there was no tax increase for the longest period in New Mexico? There was no tax increase for the longest period in New Mexico. There was not one penny of entitlement liability uh, added to New Mexico taxpayers. There was this whole, uh, you know, what has Johnson vetoed today and why? That, yes. was, that was the television, that was the radio, that was the newspaper. And even your fellow Republicans were ticked off. A third of the bills I vetoed were Republican bills because, uh, hate to say it, but Republicans seem to grow government just like Democrats. And uh, only two of my bills were overridden, so it really made a huge difference, I think, statewide. And you got reelected even though the politicians were angry at you. I got reelected in a state that was two to one Democrat by saying no to government spending, by saying uh, yes to the individual, no to government uh, and I just think it speaks to the fact that people appreciate good stewardship of tax dollars. I was a penny, penny pincher. All right. Well, now you want to be president. Let's run through some of the issues. Speaking of pinching pennies, the big ones, Medicare, Social Security, health care. What would you do? I would uh, return Medicaid uh, and Medicare to the states. Block grant the states a fixed amount of money from the federal government, 43 percent less than what we're currently spending, 50 laboratories of innovation. There would be best practices. We would deliver health care to the poor and those over 65, and we'd, we'd do a good job of doing that. But Washington top down, it doesn't work. That's, what, that's what's got us into the position we're in, which is bankruptcy. Under Congressman Ryan's plan, some of this would be vouchered out. That's okay with you? You know, it, it's a step in the right direction. 
I would propose a balanced federal budget in the year 2013. Well, you can propose it, but how do you get there? What are you going to cut? Well, you'd cut government by 43%. So you'd start off with Medicaid and Medicare, uh, block granting that from the federal government to the state government, and then you'd move on to defense. Cutting 43%, you're stealing my Medicare. You're crippling the old people. Take Based on my experience in New Mexico, uh, I changed Medicaid in New Mexico from a fee-for-service model to a managed care model. Saved a whole. Basically, I gave everyone in the state that was receiving Medicaid my health insurance policy as governor of New Mexico. It saved a lot of money. But what about the notion that this has been a failure from day one from the federal government and we're forced to wear this, this uh, one-size-fits-all, and it doesn't fit? It's suffocating. <laughs> Government has a role to protect me against individuals that would do me harm, whether that be property damage, uh, whether that be physical harm. The, the federal government has an obligation to protect us against foreign governments that would raise arms against us. But beyond that, uh, government does way too much, costs so how way much of that too much. would you keep? Well, just for, uh, just for simplicity's sake, uh, I would keep 57% uh, of it and uh, do away with 43% of it. Because that's the amount of money that we're currently borrowing and printing uh, when it comes to covering our obligations. And explain that. I'm a little stuck on the why 43 percent. Why is that's the, the, when you take one point six five trillion dollars as a percentage of the entire budget, which is three point six trillion. That's basically borrowing 43 percent, borrowing and printing 43 percent of everything it is that we're currently spending. Tax policy. What would you change? Uh, if I could wave a magic magic wand, uh, I would eliminate the federal corporate income tax. Understanding. <laughs> you people a bunch of corporate <laughs> chills clearly and yet you look so young some of you I'm Und sorry well understanding that the corporate tax is a is a double tax you and I own the corporations when money gets distributed to you and I at that point that's when we pay tax on that reestablish this country as the only place to start up grow uh, nurture business waving a magic wand I would eliminate the IRS I would eliminate <laughs> collect the taxes. We need some tax. I, I would eliminate the IRS. I would eliminate the income tax. Fair tax would be the only tax. Now that's waving the magic wand. I think right now that uh, what needs to be concentrated on is slashing spending, something that has never happened uh, in our lifetimes. What about education? Education. So the number one thing that the federal government could do to improve education in this country would be to eliminate the Department of Education. Because give education back to the states. 50 laboratories of innovation, 50 laboratories of best practices, there would be best practice. There would be failure. Failure would get avoided. Best practice would get emulated. In New Mexico, I was more outspoken than any governor in the country regarding school choice, believing that the only way we really reform education is to bring competition to public education. So federal government, give it back to me as governor of New Mexico. I'm going to push for a voucher system, which is what I did in New Mexico, which would have brought about that competition. But the reason the Federal Education Department was created is because the wise elites in Washington who really studied this saw what the states were doing and they said, no, we can do better. We can get the best knowledge and direct the money. And, and of course, we, we all intuitively know that one size doesn't fit all, fit all. Washington dictating how 50 states should conduct education. Washington, D.C. telling New York City uh, what they should do when it comes to their education. Well, aren't they smarter in Washington than in many states? I take all of it back. You're, you're right, John. You're right. You're right. All right, let's, uh, enough on policy for a moment. Let's talk about your chances. I mean, you are a long shot. The media are skeptical of your chances. CNN is about to host a Republican debate in New Hampshire. They didn't even invite you. When I started this whole process, I 
absolutely thought that I would have a seat at the table. Uh, I was a two-term governor of New Mexico. I'm an entrepreneur. I, I started up a one-man handyman business in Albuquerque in 1974 and actually grew that business to employ over a thousand people. I, I really think that I have what it takes. He started going door to door doing handyman work. Ha handyman work. Build a thousand person construction company. Uh, uh, dream come true. Show up on time, do what you say you'll do for people. Um, you I were unknown when you ran for governor. They said you couldn't, you had no chance of being governor. Four months before the primary in New Mexico, they did a poll in New Mexico. Who would you vote for on the Republican side of the ticket? I was at 2% of the Republican vote. I had worked harder than anybody to that point, and I'll, I'll just say that it's very corollary to what's happening right now. So it's but eight CNN months away. saying, oh, we're not going to include him. He doesn't count. Well, I, I, find, that, uh, I, I find that to be... Uh, um, maybe that's the best thing that could have ever happened because I get to be on this show for one solid hour. Thank you very much. I, I don't. At, at the last debate to which he was invited, the reporters asking questions sort of ignored him for much of the debate until he interrupted. Governor Pallante, wait, 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 this is like nine questions for all these guys and none for me. So well, it, if the you fair tax, the fair Governor Johnson, Johnson thing here. Just, I, okay. All right. All right. It's okay. It's okay. So oh, they, they paid a little more attention to you then. I'd like to think that it was just an honest mistake, that somehow somebody passed over my name and everything was fine after that. So stay with us. Gary Johnson, we have much more. Now, as we said, he's running for the Republican presidential nomination, but he advocates things that have horrified many Republicans. And when we return, a social conservative is here to confront him about that. The Republican presidential nominee. When I hear that, I hear social conservative. I'm told that Republicans, to win, must be anti-abortion, anti-gay marriage, for the war on drugs, for stricter immigration controls. Gary Johnson's for none of that. And he isn't even, and neither is the audience. <laughs> Candidate Johnson isn't even religious. He doesn't go to church. That's unheard of in many conservative circles. Republican strategist Karen Hanrady says that's not going to fly in a Republican primary. No, it's not going to fly in a Republican primary. I think it's a lot of it actually uh, isn't going to fly with uh, a lot of mainstream voters, in fact. Um, uh, well, what about that? You're going to yeah. say, I don't go to church. I don't believe in God. Well, I don't No, I, I don't say that. I believe in God. I don't go to church, but I certainly don't uh, lead with these kinds of things. Yeah, I think but that they're 60... going to bring it up. I think this they will bring it up. Especially well, and that's in Iowa. and that's fair game. Sure. It's absolutely fair game. I, I think I, I'm not an, in the minority here when it comes to uh, believing in God and not attending church. But the reality is, when you go to Iowa and you go to a caucus, um, there is a very religious, religiously conservative um, constituency in these early primary voting states. Absolutely, um, absolutely. that I think are far more religiously conservative than many people even realize. I mean, you know, I don't, have you had people lay hands on you and pray, Gary? <laughs> because oh, yes. That's a big part of the Republican caucus. That's a big part of the Republican primary and going to the Voters Values Summit. Um, I think it, Karen? You, the, you, yeah. the Republican candidates go to a caucus and people lay hands on well, them? Well, you know, it's not, it's, yeah. I mean, it's not uncommon, right? This is a very personal connection with them. You know, they often want to hear from Republican candidates. What's your, what's your uh, testimony? What's your walk with Christ? What are the values you and I share in common? And I think that's a really important part of connecting with these voters. And I think it's something that you would struggle with. So you're with. toast. Well, no. I, I, first of all, I respect the, uh, the views of a social conservative. I think that 60% of Americans describe themselves as uh, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Now, I would argue that perhaps it's not socially liberal, that it's really classically liberal, which is the notion that less government is better government. 
the notion that the best thing that the government can do for me is to let me be the individual that I might be. And uh, as governor of New Mexico, I, I, I did that. Maybe they'll end up being 100 and, <laughs> 120 candidates running on the Republican side of the ticket. But right now, I, I think I'm the only candidate that would support a woman's right to choose. And I might add, I support a woman's right to choose uh, up until uh, viability of the fetus. And, When's uh, that? As, well, the, the court has actually described that as uh, being able to sustain the fetus uh, outside of the womb, even if by artificial means. Uh, that is actually the law of the land currently. So about 20 weeks or so. I think you'd have a very difficult time getting past um, a lot of Republican primary voters on that issue. But that's not the only issue. Um, but before we leave sure. it, you said you're, yeah. you're in the majority, but that you don't go to church. Don't the majority of Americans go to church or temple or something? I, I, I don't. I, I think the majority of Americans consider themselves uh, religious, but uh, I don't know if the majority of uh, Americans actually attend church. But I would say a majority of Republicans in South Carolina, for instance, which is an certainly, important primary certainly. state, go to church. In fact, if you drive through South Carolina, you'll see something that I certainly did not see living 20 years in California, which is street signs uh, uh, indicating, you know, it's five miles to the next church. I mean, these are, these are street signs in South Carolina. Well, and, and so it's, it's part of their culture. In an early Republican primary, election, you're going to have a difficult time connecting. And that's a big part of getting elected is connecting with people and having a shared sense sure, of values. Sure. And, and I might be wrong, but uh, I happen to think that uh, given that there are 11 or 12 candidates running on the Republican side of the ticket, that I'm going to offer up a choice that doesn't exist anywhere else. Well, I definitely uh, agree uh, with that. And that <laughs> choice to legalize prostitution, and I guarantee you there's not another candidate, even on the Democratic side, who's going to want to legalize prostitution. Well, and, and I, I've never actually uh, led with the notion of legalizing prostitution. What I've been asked uh, many times is, is uh, would you legalize prostitution? And my answer to that is, is that, first of all, I don't have any desire to engage the uh, services of a prostitute, and I, <laughs> and I, and I, and I never have, stipulate. and I never have, but... Uh, we already have one state that has done this. Mm -hmm. And if you were to engage in prostitution, where is it that you would want to engage prostitution? You'd want to do that in Nevada, where it was safe, where, where it was safe and where it was legal. Likewise, drugs. You would decriminalize at least marijuana. Well, I, I would... <laughs> I would legalize marijuana, and I say legalize as opposed to decriminalize, because I think decriminalize, I think decriminalize turns its back on half the problem, which is uh, the marketplace. When it comes to all the other drugs, in a nutshell, we should look at the drug problem first as a health issue rather than a criminal justice issue. But that's not how voters look at it. Voters are not, as particular, I would say voters across the board. In fact, if you look at the polls, you don't really have support for legalizing marijuana, even in the Democratic. Uh, actually, the Democratic actually voters. we're just two but, years away from being at a tipping point on but, that issue. But you look at it as a health issue. I think you come at it from a very um, theoretical, scientific point of view, but I think it's politically tone deaf. Well, let, let me tell you my experience with marijuana, that it's not theoretical. I've smoked marijuana, I've drank alcohol, and although I don't do either today, the big difference between marijuana and alcohol is that marijuana is a lot safer. And for the 100 million Americans who smoke marijuana, I think there's a recognition of that. So but do you recognize, do you recognize how difficult it is that you're taking a position that a majority of Republican primary voters absolutely disagree with? Karen, thank you very much. Gary, stay with us. Next, we'll go to war. Uh, two wars, actually. We're going to talk about the war against terror and the war against drugs when we come back. Devoting all of tonight's show to another presidential candidate, Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico. My last guest took him on skeptically from the right. My next guest, historian Thaddeus Russell, attacks him from the left. So take it away. I heard a remarkable thing on Fox News the other night. Um, a politician actually um, 
mentioned a, a study done about the Portugal drug decriminalization policy. Ten years, for ten years, all drugs in Portugal have been decriminalized since 2001. And they found that across the board, all the harmful effects of drugs have decreased since that policy was enacted. And, and that politician th- was? That politician was Gary Johnson. Um, <laughs> On and Sean Hannity's show. I uh, it was on Sean Hannity's show. But then I looked at Gary Johnson's position on drugs, and actually, as radical as Republicans might think he is, I think he's not radical enough. Yeah, we didn't really explain it. You propose dec- legalizing marijuana, and that's it. None of, not well, the other drugs. Well, I think that uh, if we legalize marijuana, we will take giant steps forward toward rational drug policy with regard to the rest of the drugs. Uh, If we legalized all drugs tomorrow, the world would be a better planet. But uh, I have to to tell you, I'm not advocating that. What's the intellectual logic behind it? Do we own our own bodies, whether we're adults or not? That that you take this there on that intellectual argument, uh, but that we take the step to legalize marijuana. We do that. We understand that then we, we come to recognize that the sky isn't going to fall that things are actually better as a result of, of doing that. And then we move on and uh, we actually start looking at uh, the rest of the drugs uh, from a harm reduction st- standpoint, uh, reducing death, disease, crime, corruption. Portugal decriminalized all drugs 10 years ago, and they've shown a 50% reduction in heroin use over the last 10 years. I mean, that kind of flies in the face of logic. But that's what's happened. So why don't... You want to cr- decriminalize all drugs? If you're going to start off with the whole enchilada, uh, I, don't, I don't see it happening. Oh, well, I think that is the problem. I mean, I think this, there's two problems that Gary Johnson faces here, and they're, co- they're coming together. He's the one who cited this Portugal study, 10 years of history, that shows that decriminalizing all drugs does great wonders for society. Unfortunately, he's running within the Republican Party, which is a majority of Christian conservatives, and he knows that he simply can't win the primary if he pushes that far on this issue. I mean, can you blame him? What do you want? Look at the heat he's already taken from Republicans from, for the mild stance he's taken, and here he is on that show with Sean Hannity. The idea that America would legalize or, or, or go down this road is repugnant to me because I don't think government should have that role in in the destruct the moral destruction of a human soul, which is and which Sean, is I it, want which you, is predictable. Yes, I don't want our kids criminalized. The moral destruction of the human soul. You want him to push that in the Republican primary? <laughs> <laughs> well, some people think that's what the Republicans are doing already, but um, <laughs> cheap laugh. Uh, Let's move on to one more subject. From your CPAC speech, speaking of realistic, you said the only party that's going to save this country is the Republican Party. You object to that. I think he should leave the Republican Party. I think he should either run as an independent or as Governor Johnson. So I would just say I've been treated really well by the Republican Party my entire career, and I I am continued to be treated well by the Republican Party. I see the Republican Party as the only party that gets us gets us out from under what is going to be a financial collapse. Again, I applaud you, and I'm frustrated by you. <laughs> Let's move on to the war on terror. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I Governor to Johnson, what's your position on <laughs> Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya? Uh, I was opposed to Iraq from the get-go. Uh, I didn't see a military threat from Iraq. I thought we had... And now, so what should we do? Right now, get out of Iraq. Tomorrow. Uh, Afghanistan. I thought Afghanistan was uh, initially totally warranted. We were attacked. We attacked back. Uh, and after six months of being in Afghanistan, we'd wiped out Al-Qaeda. That was ten years ago. We're building roads, schools, bridges, highways, and hospitals in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we're borrowing and printing money to the tune of 43 cents out of every dollar to do that. Let's get out of Iraq and Afghanistan tomorrow. And for all all of the debate and the discussion that we would have about uh, problems associated with doing that, I I would argue that we'll have that same debate and that same discussion 25 years from now if that's when we finally decide to get out. Hallelujah. But I would say that a vast majority of the Republican Party is not only Christian conservative, but also pro-war. 
And so I think this man, if he continues to say these things, and I hope he does, will simply die in that party. So I think that what you're saying echoes what a lot of people believe about the Republican Party. You're, you're, you're dead on with what it is that you're saying about the Republican Party. I'm going to give Republicans an opportunity to check off my name as their spokesperson. And what does that say to you and the rest of the world if Republicans actually nominate me? And, but, and that's Pig's where I... Is what I would say. <laughs> and maybe that ends up to be the case. But I'm actually putting myself out there to put that very question to the test. Thaddeus Russell, thank you very much. Next, Governor Johnson, if he wins the Republican nomination, will have to debate President Obama. What would that be like? Well, let's find out. The president has been gracious enough to join us here in the studio tonight. He sure looks like President Obama. Sounds like him, too. Uh, so you want to uh, uh, legalize drugs, huh? So, Governor, don't answer yet. They will debate next. <laughs> And now, the presidential debate, or what passes for one in my show. Presidential candidate Gary Johnson is here, along with an imitation of President Obama. Reggie Brown may be an actor, but what he says tonight will be almost entirely the president's own words. I'll play the role of moderator. So, Gary Johnson wants to repeal your health care legislation, Mr. President, and cut spending on Medicare. Uh, well, let me be absolutely clear here. Uh, I will preserve these health care programs as a promise we make to each other in this society. It was a promise. I, I think that we should deliver health care to the poor and those over 65 and that we can do it, but that we can do it by uh, spending a whole lot less money. And, Mr. President, uh, I think we need to balance the federal budget. Medicare is going to completely engulf the federal budget here in a very short amount of time if we don't bring it under control. But, Mr. President, you've said that these entitlements are crucial, are a big part of America. Uh, well, look, we are a better country because of these commitments. And furthermore, with the shrinking benefit uh, to pay rising costs. You want to shrink it by 43%? I just think that if we don't address these issues, we're going to all be left with nothing. And that makes for a hard campaign to run, the notion that uh, we all need to, to take, uh, take on a little bit of pain here. But better that we take on a little bit of pain here rather than die as a patient. And I'm talking now about the United States and the fact uh, that we would have a monetary collapse. All right, you, you heard what... Uh Candidate Johnson said about education earlier. What's your response to that, Mr. President? Well, Gary Johnson's offering the same tired rhetoric about vouchers. Now, we need to fix and improve our public schools, not throw our hands up and walk away from them. Well, and uh, what do you say about the fact that uh, the federal government gives states 11 cents out of every single dollar that they spend, but that, the, but that it comes with strings and uh, mandates attached to it, that it's really a negative for states to take federal money. Well, I don't think it's fair to really ask him because he's actually just an actor. But, <laughs> but, but you, he, did you, say, he, he did say that your plan is basically throwing our hands up and walking away from the public schools. Uh, I think that, it, that it's just the opposite, that it's this notion of embracing free markets, and free markets would include uh, education. We might actually deliver better educational services for less money. That's a very real possibility. But it's not going to happen from Washington. It'll, it'll happen uh, if, if you give it to the states and let the states innovate. Governor Johnson, what would you do about trade? Uh, I'm a free market guy. So when it comes to trade, uh, believing in free markets, there's a magic to free markets. The Department of Commerce, that might be a good one to, uh, good one to eliminate uh, in that uh, just comes up with a whole lot of restriction that uh, ends up... Uh, inhibiting uh, American business rather than enhancing it. So no tariffs and no restrictions? No tariffs, everybody no restrictions. Jobs and goods move to China. Jobs and goods that we all benefit from the lower cost of goods and services and that we embrace that notion. Mr. President? Now, Mr. Johnson supports unregulated trade. But for America to win, American workers have to win too. And that's why uh, any agreement I support has to contain enforceable standards for workers. 
Yeah, that sounds so good. You know, workers have to win, too. No, it, it does sound good. Uh, but what, what we do in this country is we pass laws that uh, advantage corporations, uh, individuals, groups that are well-connected politically, as opposed to creating an environment where we all have a level playing field with all of us having access to the American dream. The American dream being going from having nothing to having everything if we're willing to work hard uh, and innovate. Now, you propose tax cuts for the rich and would completely eliminate the corporate income tax. As a country that values fairness, uh, wealthier individuals, those who have benefited most from our way of life, uh, can afford to give a little more back. But this is what, what a lot of people believe. The rich are filthy rich and can give back. Well, what I hear all the time is that uh, our, our corporations are overseas, that jobs have been leaving this country. Let's bring those jobs back to this country by making this country the only place to conduct business. So in that context, how do you do that? Eliminate the corporate income tax. Understanding that it's a double tax, that we all own the corporations, and what, when income gets distributed to you or I, that's when we pay uh, the tax on that. Now, uh, let's move on to the war on terror. Earlier in this program, we talked about Afghanistan, Iraq. Uh, we didn't quite touch on Libya. Mr. President, your position? Uh, listen, uh, we must stand alongside those who believe in the same principles that we do. Uh, our own future is safer if more of mankind can live with the bright freedom, uh, bright light of freedom. You know, uh, I just think that uh, military intervention in uh, Libya is unwarranted A through Z. Uh, number one, where was the military threat from Libya? Where was the congressional authorization to go in to Libya? Where in the Constitution... Where in the Constitution does it say that because we don't like a foreign leader, we should go in and topple that foreign leader? I like this. I really. <laughs> but what about... Have we, have we not interjected ourselves into a civil war here in Libya that is warranted in five other countries right now in the Middle East? I just don't see an end to this. But a cruel dictator was harming innocent people, and our allies said, we need your help. What we need to look at are the unintended consequences of these actions that we take. We take out Saddam Hussein in Iraq... He's the check. Iraq is the check against Iran. Now Iran is raising its head. I don't believe there is a military threat from Iran, but we should remain vigilant to what might be a military threat. But that results from taking out Saddam Hussein. So we, we, we do all of these good things in the name of uh, liberty and freedom, and the consequence oftentimes ends up being much different a more unsafe world, and uh, other dictatorships that just rise up to take over the old. Let's close with the economy. Mr. President, uh, you've been a big backer of some stimulus. Now, make no mistake, only government can break the vicious cycles that are crippling our economy. Ooh! <laughs> now... Uh, where a lack of spending leads to lost jobs, that leads to even less spending. Which is why he says we need stimulus. You need to jumpstart the economy. There are bubbles that are created in a free market system. I don't think they get quite as big, but if they do get as big, which perhaps they might, there's a day of reckoning, there's a fire sale, and that there, you end up with a steep decline and, uh, and a recovery that begins immediately. That's the free market. Uh, I think the government has stepped in the way of the fire sale. That's why we find ourselves uh, mired in this, uh, in, in the, the stimulus economic... stimulus made it worse? I think the stimulus has made it worse, yes. Mr. President? Well, I think that now it's clear more than ever before that the Recovery Act uh, has now created and saved more than one million jobs. Well, and for all those jobs, uh, I, I know that uh, you've touted uh, the savings of jobs in the automotive industry, for example. Uh, if the automotive industry would have been allowed to fail, gone into bankruptcy, 
I think that you could argue that uh, General Motors would have uh, emerged from that process as the true car company of the 21st century, as opposed to uh, perhaps a dinosaur that's still on life support uh, because, of, uh, because of the government intervening. And in the case of bailing out the banks, these were individuals, these were banks that made horrible decisions that were bailed out at, 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 my, at all of our expense. They should have been allowed to fail. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, candidate Johnson and Mr. President. And I should yeah. say his words, again, uh, were the words of the actual president. <laughs> Stick around. In a moment, our audience gets to question you. We're back now with your questions for Republican presidential candidate and former New Mexico governor Gary Johnson. Yes. Uh, candidate Johnson, as a supporter of Ron Paul, why do you think, uh, as a libertarian, and I think a lot of us are, why do you think we should switch over to supporting your campaign versus Ron Paul's? You know, I wouldn't pretend uh, to make that argument to you. That is, that is something that you're going to have to make a choice on, and uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not the guy to answer that question. I'm not avoiding the question. I just, uh, uh, really, that's, that's, that's your choice. Okay, and? Uh, I think my question might be similar, but Congressman Paul over the years has consistently embodied Republican principles. How do you respond to those people who ask you what your candidacy can add? Well, the notion of actually winning. I mean, that's the, that's the, that's the idea here. Now, that may turn out to be far-fetched, but... Uh, Look, uh, Dr. Paul got 8% during the last cycle. Uh, it, it was a great statement. He, he's a terrific spokesperson. But that 8% has to grow to 40% plus if this is going to be successful and actually govern. So that might not end up to be the case, but that's the, that's the stab here on my part. Yes, sir. Hello, Governor. Being a high school student from uh, New York, uh, I see that in our history classes and our economics classes, we're oftentimes taught Keynesian School of Economics. Um, I know you're in favor of the Chicago School and the Austrian School of Economics. What would you do to defeat the Keynesian brand? You're a high school student? Yeah. <laughs> hey, and my friend's right here. And explain Keynesianism. Basically, it's more spending, more regulation, rather than uh, our approach of economic freedom. Wow, well, I wish so, I'd gone to his high school. But <laughs> So I, I think when people hear, uh, hear the story about the uh, uh, Panama Canal being uh, dug, and I believe that this may have been Hayek that went to see the Panama, Panama Canal being dug, and he said, well, why are they digging with uh, shovels and, and not uh, using uh, heavy equipment? This is about jobs. And his response was, well, then have them dig with spoons. That's Keynesian economics. I heard the same story with Milton Friedman in China, uh, but maybe it's apocryphal. Maybe it's not, <laughs> but it's an important so, so, message in that. Uh, yes? do, do, we, do we benefit from, uh, from a uh, tornado moving through town and breaking every single window in town? Uh, no, I don't think we do. Yes. And from another high school student, how would you react to state nullification challenges to improper federal laws? And do you think that that's a constitutionally viable remedy for federal overreach? Well, uh, that I would be a champion for states' rights uh, and that uh, the whole nullification movement, I'm, I'm excited by it. I'm excited by the notion that states are standing up to the federal government and uh, as president of the United States, uh, you, would, you would see a shift in uh, in. Uh, in how this country's uh, business gets conducted from the federal government to the states. And finally, from Facebook, again, Wesley Kretschmer asks, would you give a presidential pardon to all nonviolent drug offenders? Uh, yes, I think that that needs to be part of this process. Um, all right, well, thank you, Governor Johnson. I have to ask you to leave now because when we come back, I'm going to tell you what I really think of it. And that's next. <laughs> so now we know a little more about presidential candidate Gary Johnson. 
I kind of liked what I heard because Governor Johnson wants to cut the budget, get government out of health care, get it out of foreign wars, get it away from interfering with voluntary exchanges between consenting adults. And most importantly, he wants to stop the growth of government. And that's good because the vision of the founders, limited government is laid out here in the Constitution, is good enough. And when politicians go way beyond this and add to it, they don't make America better, they make it worse. And they do keep adding. I mean, that's the number of papers they added just last year. This pile of regulations, more than 80,000 pages, is just what the federal government imposed on us. States and towns added even more. And, of course, all these rules started out as a politician's good intention. Somewhere in here is something to make us safer and make life more fair. But as Governor Johnson once explained, responsible politicians see past good intentions. I vetoed a dog and cat exercise bill. And this was a Republican bill. But for my signature, it would have been law in New Mexico that pet stores exercise their dogs and cats two hours a day, three times a week. I signed that piece of legislation. I have to then establish the dog and cat exercise police. Well intentioned, but come on, where does government end and where does personal responsibility begin? The founders knew. Government should end at keeping the peace and enforcing contracts and property rights. Limited government leaves people free to pursue their own dreams. Gary Johnson's the rare politician who understands that, which might be why pundits laugh at the idea of his becoming president. They don't even include him in some of the presidential polls. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a shot. Around this time in the 1992 election cycle, hardly anyone outside Arkansas knew who a guy named Bill Clinton was. Polls put him and Paul Tsongas at the back of the pack. They were getting maybe 3% of the vote. By November, Bill Clinton was only at 6%. The so-called frontrunner was Mario Cuomo. Today, many people don't know who he is. And before the last presidential election, most Americans thought a freshman senator from Illinois had no chance against Hillary Clinton. Look what happened. Anything can happen. That's why we have elections. And yes, it's true that when we showed people Governor Johnson's picture, most had no clue who he was. I have no clue. He looks familiar, though. He looks like an insurance salesman that, like, makes so people don't want insurance anymore. No idea. No idea. Who's this guy? That's Gary Johnson, former governor of New Mexico. Only this young man knew. You like him? Yeah. Why do you like him? To me, he takes a great pretty consistent stance for freedom across the board. So, you know, he wants uh, businessmen to be able to make a profit and still allow people to, you know, do recreational things they enjoy in the privacy of their homes, that type of stuff. And frankly, the past number of decades, I can't think of anybody that could come close to as being as good as he would be. I mean, he would actually uphold some of the things that I think people admire about our country, you know, a, a genuine sense of freedom that most people come here to enjoy. Right. And we need more politicians like Gary Johnson, candidates who have the courage and humility to say, yeah, that law sounds good. If it were my job to run your life, I would support that law. But it's not my job. It's not any politician's job. I'm just going to try to keep you safe and leave you alone. Government can't run your life and it shouldn't try. That's our show for tonight. In future weeks, we'll devote the full hour to other candidates. Herman Cain will be next. Thanks for watching. Good night.